Whenever we have two particles in 3D space, we know that in general that uh, can give rise to orbital angular momentum because of the relative motion of those particles. In this video, we will discuss the angular momentum squared and a component of orbital moment, uh, angular momentum in quantum mechanics. Uh, more specifically, what we will do, we will construct the eigenvalue spectrum of uh, these two operators and we will construct the eigenstates which are uh, which are the simultaneous eigenstates of both of these operators because we already know that L squared commutes with Lz and L squared commutes with Lx and L squared commutes with Ly. So the magnitude uh, square operator commutes with all three components uh, of the orbital angular momentum. So in this video, what we are going to do is construct the eigenstates which are common to both of these operators and also uh, find uh, their eigenvalues. So I'm labeling these states by this uh, right now by this two parameters lambda and m where this lambda defines the eigenvalue of this operator and just uh, uh, for convenience let's define the eigenvalue of lambda h cap square because uh, since this is uh, momentum squared this h bar has uh, the dimension of momentum so this h bar square takes care of the dimension of uh, this orbital uh, angular momentum operator squared so this lambda is a dimensionless number uh, which is uh, uh, being used to label this state similarly this m defines the eigenvalue of the z component operator and uh, similarly we have no use h bar here because this is angular momentum so dimension is being taken care of by this so this m is a dimensionless parameter right now this lambda and m they are both arbitrary they are just some eigenvalues uh, that we get for these operators so in this uh, video what we are going to do is see what are the relationships with, the, with each other and uh, uh, what more we can uh, tell about these eigenvalues from these commutator relations okay so let's begin by noting that if I project this to this state and I'm assuming that these lambda m are normalized states we can always do that so this L square will give us lambda h bar square lambda m lambda m and since this is normalized this is 1 so I get lambda h bar square but since we know that the uh, inner product of any uh, state uh, uh, in the Hilbert space uh, is uh, a real positive number uh, so it means that this has to be greater or equal to 0 and we have our first information about this lambda that this lambda is a real positive number so this is we know about this lambda now okay to learn more about these eigenvalues and this eigenstate we it's better if we introduce uh, auxiliary operators uh, we will later see that we call them raising and lowering operators for some reason uh, they are similar to what you studied as raising and lowering operator of total angular momentum and also recently uh, we had similar types of operators when we were studying harmonic oscillators so we can construct these non-Hermitian operators as superposition of x and y component of orbital angular momentum where L plus is with plus and L minus with minus this is iota. And we can immediately see that uh, since Lx and Ly they commute with L square, this L plus minus they both commute with L square as well. So now uh, we have this thing 0 and 
we have this thing zero because this is these are nothing but superposition of l x and l y and this l square commutes with both l x and y so this is zero so uh, using these new operators uh, let's see what we can learn more about uh, these uh, uh, these eigenvalues and eigenstates and before I do that let me uh, notice let me just work out a couple of relations that will be useful later on first of all let's see what's the commutation relation of l plus minus with lz so lz l plus minus 1 let's work it out so we have lz lx plus minus plus minus iota and y so and z and x plus minus iota and z and y and uh, using the commutator of lx and lz and ly and lz uh, we can see that this is nothing but h bar and plus minus because we get uh, lx from here and ly from here and then we can combine them together to write l plus minus operator again and also i will need uh, another relation uh, another expanded form of these two operators so let me just note quickly that this is nothing but uh, l square l plus minus equal to l plus l square and the lower one is nothing but L square L minus L minus L square. Okay, now we are equipped with uh, all the tools. And let me just remind you all of these things are just coming from these commutator relations that we have already found. All right, so let's now see. What are the actions of these L plus and L minus uh, on these eigenstates? So for that, let me work out what this L plus does to this state L M by multi by by by, uh, by operating with L Z. So if I operate this state with lz we can see that immediately if i use uh, this commutator so this lz l plus is equal to so this commutator gives me lz l plus minus minus L plus minus L Z is equal to plus minus H cut L plus minus. So using this commutation relation, I can write this L Z L plus as so L Z L plus is equal to h cut l plus so this minus becomes plus on the other side this becomes l plus l z so where is this l coming from it's not l this is lambda sorry this is lambda this is lambda. Okay. So I started with this, and this is coming out to be equal to this because of this computation relation. Now I see if I operate Lz and this, I get m here and h cup h bar, and I can take this L plus 
common. So h bar is left here, and here I get m h bar lambda m, and I can take since this is a subsequent multiplier, I can take it out. So this is m plus one h bar l plus lambda m, and this is equal to this thing l z l plus lambda. This is an important equation because this tells us that operation of l z on this state, whatever this state is, giving us m plus one h bar and this state there. It means that this is an eigenstate of l z operator with an eigenvalue m plus one h bar. Which means that this is nothing but a state which is proportional to this lambda m plus 1 state. And this is some proportionality constant C plus. Because if this state is not like this, when we operate Lz, we wouldn't get m plus 1 for. So this relation tells us that this L plus, when it operates to this lambda M state, this simply raises the index M by an integer 1. Okay, So that's why we call this L plus a raising operator. Because it raises the index M by 1 whatever m is. Okay, similarly if we had begun with l minus, we would have ended up with m minus 1 here, which means that l minus operator is nothing but a lowering operator that when it operates on this lambda m state, it lowers the state index by 1. M index, it doesn't do anything to lambda. Okay, so let me just summarize this board before I uh, push it upward. We begin with these commutation relations, then we said lambda and um, are two eigenvalues that label this uh, simultaneous eigenstate of L square and L C, and we know now that lambda has to be positive. That's all we know about lambda so far, and we constructed two new operator L plus L minus and because of this commutator uh, between L z and L plus minus we are now able to see that L plus is a raising operator for M index and L minus is a lowering index for uh, a lowering operator for M index. Okay, so I mean uh, equipped with this knowledge let me just uh, quickly, you know, remind you that since uh, L plus is an operator which does something to index M, this, and since we know that this commutes with L square, if we operate L square to this, we will simply get lambda h bar square out. So this operator does nothing to lambda, lambda, and, and it still remains an eigenstate of L square operator because L plus commute with the uh, L plus operator. Similarly, if we had uh, an L minus on this, which would have lower the index with some proportionality constant c minus we would still get lambda x square over here okay so let's now see what using these operators what we can say about m in lambda so let me just give it a little title relation between 
lambda f plus. For this, uh, you can physically see one thing right away that let's say this is our coordinate system and we have some vector L, we can see that its Z component has a magnitude which is in general always going to be either equal at most or less than this L, which means that we can roughly say that L square mod is always going to be greater than or equal to Lz square. And in terms of eigenvalues, we can say that since its eigenvalue is lambda, its eigenvalue is m, so m square. So this is what we should expect physically anyway. That this lambda should always be uh, greater than or at most equal to m square. Or on the other hand, m we can say is always going to be less than or equal to lambda square root and of course both positive and negative values are possible because we can have the same vector on this side with a z component along negative direction but i can actually formally drive it as well let's see formally if I have some state lambda m and I operate on it this lx square operator and ly square operator we should always get some positive real number because when this operator operates on this thing we get uh, another state in the Hilbert space and when we take its projection on a lambda m we get some positive real number. So this should always be true which means that and since this lx square plus ly square are nothing but l square minus lz square and this l square will give us lambda h power square and this lz square will give us m square h power square so we have lambda minus m square h bar square greater than zero because this lambda m lambda m will then be one so this also tells us the same thing as here that this lambda has to be greater than or equal to m square so this is the first information that we know about the relationship between m and lambda that m has to be either smaller or equal to lambda square root plus minus. Okay. Let's see what more we can say. Since we know that this L plus is a raising operator and m now has an upper limit that it can at most be equal to uh, something because there is an upper limit uh, that cannot be greater than this. So let's say let that m maximum value of m is some l. Okay, so this is some l, some real number. Uh, so let's if this is the maximum value, it means if we have a state lambda l we should get zero because this is the maximum L that we can have and if we operate the raising operator we should get zero. Now let's uh, from starting from this equation let me now operate with L minus on both sides and if I operate L minus on both sides of this equation I get this and from here, I can put the value of L minus, L minus is Lx minus iota Ly, L plus is Lx plus iota Ly, lambda L, now this is Lx square, 
this is iota iota minus 1 plus minus minus so plus ly square and then I have uh, if I take this minus iota common ly lx and this is lx ly and since minus iota is common so this is lx ly and all of this is operating on lambda l now see this is nothing but l square minus l z square and let's see what this is this is a commutator between so let me just write it l y l x and using the commutator of l y l z we should get h bar iota h bar l x uh, uh, l y l z sorry this is commutator of l y l x not l z so this is l y l x and we know l x l y commutator is plus iota h bar l z so this would be minus iota h bar l z so we should get l square minus l z square so this is minus iota h bar l z minus minus plus and then iota iota square minus one so minus h bar l z now when we apply all of these operators here we get for l square i get lambda h bar square for l z square i get l square h bar square for l z i get h bar l so this is minus h bar square l lambda now on the right side we have zero so the state in general is not zero which means that this eigenvalue has to be zero so uh, which means that lambda minus l square minus l has to be zero because I can take this h bar square common. So let me use it here because this is giving me that lambda minus l square minus l has to be zero. So I can solve it easily that lambda is l square plus l. Now if I take l common, it's l plus one. Okay, so no, this is an important piece of information we have. We now find the value of lambda in terms of L, where L was the maximum value of L. So it means our states lambda M, I can label them as L into L plus 1 M. And always remember that whenever now I will apply L square to the state lambda M, I should get L into L plus 1 lambda M because whenever we apply L square, we always get the maximum value of M into maximum value of M plus 1. So essentially, if maximum value is L, whenever we apply L square, we should we get L into L plus 1 because lambda is equal to this. And now, instead of labeling the state lambda M, what I will do, I will use this label L, M, because this is L into L plus 1. L. This is just for convenience. Usually, we, uh, if there's a small symbol for eigenvalue, we can directly label the state with that. But we don't have to, we can always do it with something else as well, as far as we know uh, how this in the, uh, label is connected with the eigenvalue. So the eigenvalue is L into L plus 1, and uh, it would be silly to write L into L plus 1 all the time here. So we just write L, but remember that the eigenvalue is L into L plus 1. Okay, so. Now we actually know quite a lot of uh, information about M and lambda. First of all, we know that M changes by 1. 
and when it keeps going up, its maximum value L has a relationship with this through this. And on the other hand, uh, we can you know uh, think of it like this: that L square has a certain value, and then M starts taking value from here and into L, and then it goes down from there. Okay, so if we had, uh, we can do the same, and you know, assume that there is some minimum value of L. Let minimum M is some L prime. We don't know L, what L prime is, which means that if this is minimum. If I apply my lowering operator to this state lambda L prime, I should get zero, which means that if I operate with L plus minus on both sides, and similarly if I put expression for L plus and L minus, what we get at the end is uh, something like this lambda minus L prime square plus L prime h bar square lambda L prime equal zero which means that lambda is has to be equal to L prime square minus L prime and if I take L prime common this is L prime one and this lambda can also be written in terms of the maximum value of L so if I use the value of lambda that we, uh, we just drive, I can write L into L plus 1 and let me just rearrange it, let's write this one first and uh, then L prime. So we can see that uh, there is only one solution possible for this which is that L prime is minus L because if L prime is minus L then when I add 1, uh, I get this, and when I keep it as it is, I get this. Uh, actually, we don't even have to rearrange it, because we can take negative sign. We take negative common from here and here, they cancel. So these two sides are equal if the minimum value of L prime is equal to minus of the maximum value of L. So now uh, we have a very nice relationship that M goes from minus L to L, whereas the magnitude square eigenvalue is given by this. So to label these eigenstates lambda M, all we need is actually only two labels, one is L and the other is M. Because from these two labels, we can get all the simultaneous eigenstates of L square and LZ operator. Because when L square will operate, the eigenvalue would be L into L plus 1. When LZ operate, uh, we get M, and M can have values like let's say if I start from L, L minus 1, L minus 2, all the way to minus L. Okay, so, so far, this is what we know. However, there is still uh, a couple of things that are unknown. For example, we have not said anything if M or L are integers or not. All we know is that they are real numbers. And M changes by integer value uh, from one value to another. And the total arbitrary angular momentum is L into L plus 1. Its second value is L into L plus 1. Let's now go a bit further and see if these M and L are integer themselves or not. Okay, for that I need the arbitral angular momentum operator in the spherical coordinate. So let's work out LZ operator in 
spherical coordinates. Okay. Now, a spherical coordinate system is something like this. That if I have a, a vector r, its angle theta is the z axis, and if I project this r vector in the xy plane, the angle of the projection with the x axis is called phi. And you see this theta is uh, between 0 and 90, uh, 0 and 180, and phi can be between you know 0 and 360 degrees or 0 and 2 pi. But if we have a point here, and if I project it here and take to the you know floor and find its whatever angle phi, let's say 30 degrees. And if I rotate this point by 360 degrees, I come back to the same point. So physically it's the same point, even though my value of phi is now whatever before plus 2 pi. And if I rotate it twice, my angle uh, mathematically speaking is 4 pi plus whatever the angle was even though physically it's the same point. So this thing has a consequence because this means that all physical functions, they should have the same value of, uh, let's say some k. If, if there's a function of phi, our function, if it is going to represent a physical quantity, it should have this property that whatever its value is at a given phi, it should remain the same if I add 2 phi any multiple of 2 pi. Because after 2 pi, I will come to the same point. So let's exploit this property and also the uh, operator form of Lz to see what are the permissible values of m and m. To, to do that, let me, you know, this board and I will have to remove some parts So to get the form of operator Lz in the spherical coordinate system, let's say we have a straight psi and uh, let me introduce this location. A straight psi, we already know that if I express it in Cartesian coordinate, we can always, you know, uh, call this state uh, with a uh, state uh, with a wave function psi of x, y, z. Similarly, in Cartesian coordinates, r theta and phi, I can call this state function of r theta and phi, etc. Okay, so since rotation operator is the generator of arbitrary angular momentum, let's see what's the effect of rotation operator in spherical coordinate if I rotate a state around z axis. So if I have a state and I rotate it around z axis by some angle d phi, in spherical coordinate it's very simple because all it does is changes the phi angle to phi plus d phi. So it increases the angle phi little bit by d phi. Now, the corresponding graph for this state is r theta phi, r dagger, d phi. You know what, I'm not going to write this d phi k in brackets. You should uh, always have this thing in mind. Okay, so if I, if I put it on this side, I'll get r theta phi plus d phi. And since this is a rotation operation, it means that this is a unitary operator. Then 
this is one which also means that r dagger is nothing but r inverse which means that if I now operate this state r theta phi which is nothing but r inverse which is equivalent to rotating the state backward and instead of having phi plus d phi the state is rotated a little bit backward so our angle decreases by this amount d phi. Similarly the brass state corresponding to this is this r theta phi minus d phi Okay, now I have these states. Let me rub this part also. So remember the goal. We are trying to find the representation of L Z in spherical coordinates because I want to see what are the restrictions uh, on the eigenvalues m and uh, the index m. Okay, so once we have this, let me now see what's the effect of this rotation operator on a general state psi in spherical coordinates. So, and this is equivalent to, you know, applying this R to this part because this will give us R theta. From here, R applying to that side is phi minus d phi psi, which means that this is now a wave function R theta phi minus and uh, I can expand it using Taylor series and in Taylor series let's say I want to write Taylor series around point r theta phi so the rule is if you want to expand it let's say about some point r naught which in our case is r theta phi we first write the function at, around, uh, at the point where we want to expand then plus this minus this and since this r theta are going to be constant so let's only worry about this so this minus this is minus d phi and then the derivative of this function partial psi by partial phi evaluated at r theta phi and then so on and since we are interested in infinitesimal rotations let's only keep the first two terms r theta phi minus d phi partial d partial phi psi r theta phi okay and if I write it in the bracket notations I can write it r theta phi straight psi minus um, r D phi partial partial phi R theta phi and psi. And I can also expand it from its generator operation, uh, generator uh, expression, because this R theta phi R in terms of its generator is minus iota by h cut and z d phi I just uh, want to uh, stress one point that uh, in my previous uh, uh, lectures on arbitrary angular momentum, unfortunately I have used uh, plus sign over here 
but uh, since in the book it's minus sign and I'm trying to stick to the notation of minus sign, so I'll be using this minus here. Okay, now for infinitesimal notations, this is nothing but 1 minus a over h cut and z to the 5 r theta i psi. And if I now compare it with this, because you know here I can do like this d5 partial partial phi r theta phi psi. Now, if I compare this, this and this, I see that this minus is minus here, this d5 is here. So this partial partial phi is equal to iota over h cut and z, which means that you know, partial by partial phi is iota over h cut and z. Which further mean if I bring this h cut here and this iota on the other side, so L is minus iota h bar partial by partial phi. So this is the expression for the z component of arbitrary angular momentum in the spherical quadrilaterals. Of course, I could also have obtained it. Uh, uh, using R plus P and then for P I could have used uh, 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 the del operator notation and then I could have used del in spherical coordinates and uh, found the z component from there as well. Okay, so now we know the orbital momentum in the spherical coordinates and let's see What we can say about this M and M more from this. Okay, the eigenvalue equation for LZ operator was L M M H bar. L. And if I now use uh, spherical coordinates, I can project it into spherical coordinates and I get L M and H bar of the phi. Okay, so this LZ in spherical coordinate is minus iota h bar partial by partial phi r theta phi Lm and on the right side get M h bar r theta phi Lm. And just to just for the sake of convenience, let me just define this. Wave function psi and m function of r theta phi. With this notation, I can write this differential equation as minus iota. This h bar cancels from both sides. Partial psi and m by partial phi is equal to m psi and m, where psi is function of r theta phi. Okay, let's now solve this differential equation. It's pretty easy because it's first order differential equation. Uh, and we can also actually do it uh, simply by integrating on both sides. If I bring this psi here and take this d5 to the other side and then take exponential. So in both cases, this equation has a solution, some constant exponential iota m because I can take this minus iota there, it becomes plus iota. Now this is the form of the phi dependence in this straight side angle. And from this, we can uh, see what are the permissible values of m. 
uh, recalling this thing that I have written there that this has to be single valued function of phi uh, when we change phi by 2 pi. And let's see what happens if we do that. So if I add, let's say, 2 pi this phi, I get iota m phi iota m 2 pi. And this function is one only if this m is integer. Because this, if this m is not integer, then this will be different than this. So therefore, we now have an extra condition in m that whenever uh, we are considering rotations in space, our orbital angular momentum, this m has to be integer. So now uh, we have more information about this m that m is always going to be integer which has implication for l as well because this l has to be integer as well now because the maximum value of m is l and since m can only be integer l can only be integer and now we have uh, this uh, sort of complete information about m and l for orbital angular momentum that the uh, simultaneous eigenstates of orbital angular momentum can be labeled by two integers l and m where m is always between l and minus l change its value by an integer and the uh, magnitude of the orbital angular momentum is l into l plus one where l is an integer okay so this was uh, what i wanted to say about uh, the orbital angular momentum eigenstates but let me just spend two minutes on uh, a small digression and that digression is the spin of an electron and proton and neutron and so on. You see the spin of an electron is as an m value of half because uh, the spin is half h bar plus minus which now clearly tells us that the origin of these spins is not rotation of anything because if uh, we say that the spin uh, uh, momentum uh, the angles the spin angular momentum of electron is due to some kind of rotation of electron around its axis then this thing would have hold true that to make the uh, values of each rotation uh, single value that it doesn't change uh, because the physical point doesn't change m has to be integer but this m is not integer which means the origin of the spin angular momentum in elementary particle has nothing to do with their uh, spinning so to say and it is uh, an intrinsic property uh, if, it, if there is an origin for them, the origin is not the orbit, uh, the rotation of the particle where something else. Okay, uh, thank you.